and welcome to the Secretary of the Navy guest lecture series from the United States Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. I'm Dr. Jeff Padawan, Dean of Research here at NPS, and I'm honored to be your moderator today. The pace of change is increasingly driven by rapid advancements in technologies, which impacts us all from how we live our daily lives to the balance of economic and military power on the global stage. Today, we will explore technologies driving changes in our military and specifically the naval forces. 70% of the world is covered in oceans and 80% of the world's population lives near the coast. 90% of the world trade flows by ship. So the, the US Navy is vital to ensuring our peace and prosperity in the future. Naval forces must keep up with the increasingly complex and contested maritime domain. The Office of Naval Research's Science and Technology ensures the technological advantages of the future force, while the Naval Postgraduate School ensures the technological leadership of the future forces. Technology alone is not capability. It requires people trained to use it and technically competent leaders educated to understand and employ technology effectively. Today, our guest speaker will look into the future of naval science and technology. At the conclusion of his remarks, he will answer questions from a panel of NPS students about the implications of this technology. And as time permits, we'll take live questions submitted by our viewers. It is now my privilege to introduce the president of the Naval Postgraduate School, Vice Admiral Anne Rondeau, who will introduce our guest speaker. Admiral Rondeau, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you and welcome to everyone from the Naval Postgraduate School and as well as all of our many other viewers who are able to join us on this day for this terrific learning opportunity on the subject of the future force. We're very pleased and honored to have with us today a visionary leader, an authentic visionary leader, who has been at the forefront of, of defense technology of defense technology development in laboratories across the nation and on board our ships at sea. He has led a remarkable career. And I would like to share a few highlights with you of Admiral Selby. He is currently the 26th Chief of Naval Research and the commander of the Naval Research Enterprise, which includes the Office of Naval Research, the Naval Research Laboratory System, ONR Global, and PMR 51. He oversees the basic applied and advanced technology development research for the Department of the Navy, a $2 billion portfolio. As a flag officer, Admiral Selby served as the commander Naval Surface Warfare Center, then as the Navy's chief engineer and the Naval Sea Systems Command deputy commander for ship um, design, integration, and naval engineering. His shipboard tours include USS Puffer, USS Pogi, and USS Connecticut, all SSNs, and command of USS Greenville SSN 772. Ashore, Admiral Selby's staff assignments have included Deputy Director for the Navy's Liaison to the U.S. House of Representatives, Submarine Platforms and, and Strategic Programs Branch Head, and the Program Manager for both Submarine Imaging and Electronic Warfare Systems and Advanced Undersea Systems. As a graduate, of Naval, uh, as a graduate of our school, and NPS could not educate more, more effectively without participating in relevant research for all of you, which means that we could not uh, educate effectively without the Office of Naval Research. Let me also say this, Admiral Selby and I have known each other for a number of years, but when, but when he became the Chief of Naval Research, I paid a call on him. He is authentically thinking about the future force. On that day, he had been on the job about two weeks. He he cited to me the meetings that he had done about about the future of the world, the future of science and technology, and the future of the Navy. This is a man who had invested in his intellectual knowledge before taking this important leadership job. He is exemplary of the kinds of learning that everybody should be doing con continuously. And as a flag officer, he continues to read, to teach, 
to listen, to learn, and to lead in, in really difference-making ways. Students, faculty, and staff, ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome our Chief of Naval Research, Rear Admiral Lauren Selby. Admiral, over to you, sir. Oh, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for a very kind introduction and kind, very kind words. Hey, it is, a, it is an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, you know, it's it's, I get a chance to talk to a lot of groups, but I, I really particularly like talking to folks, college folks uh, that are kind of in the learning environment, uh, you know, whether it's engineering or, or whatever, it, it doesn't really matter. But you're at a point now in your career where you're you're taking a pause to advance your, you know, to advance yourself in the education realm. And I think that's critically important. I mean, I'm going to mention it. I mean, I, I, I never stop learning and, and hopefully you don't either because uh, the world is changing rapidly, and as I'll talk to you in some of my slides here in a few minutes, I think we're at a pivotal moment in history. I really do. I think we're st we're still in this we're in a we're in a transition phase, and uh, some of the discomfort we're all feeling is I think because of that transition. And uh, it's still not clear to me what where the other end is and exactly what it is. Uh, it has a lot to do with digital. I, I can guarantee you that. Um, but it. it Time will tell what this error is going to be, this new error is going to be called, but I think we're right in the middle of this transition. And I think uh, being able to adapt rapidly, learn rapidly, uh, is critical to succeeding in this, this new world we're entering. And uh, you guys are right there on the front line of that. So so with that, let's uh, let's walk through some slides. And I'm really actually, I'm going to start my clock here so I don't suck up all this time because I want to actually take your questions. But let's go to my slides. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of background about O&R first. Uh, let's go to the first slide, please. And just tell you kind of about what uh, what ONR is. Uh, so, as the you know, organization has been around since August 1946. So, 75 years uh, we've been uh, you know established. So, coming right out of World War II, there was a good recognition that we need to maintain science as foundational to our military. And in fact, uh, there was an effort to start the National Science Foundation first, but that got bogged down in some politics and. The Navy came forward with this this idea uh, to advance science, and so the Office of Naval Research was actually signed into public law on August 1st, 1946, by President Truman. And uh, we are actually celebrating that 75th year now. I have monthly speakers that come in. Uh, I'm going to have a bunch of former Chief of Naval Researchers come come in. Bob Bowers coming in, um, just trying to go back and see what we've done over our, our 75 years. And it's an amazing history. And uh, I've got another brief, which I'm not gonna go through today that talks about a lot of our accomplishments, but you know, you're seeing a lot of it come to fruition now. Artificial intelligence, we've been working on that for decades. Lasers, unmanned underwater vehicles. The whole reason you've got uh, uh, Remus vehicles is because the Navy invested in Remus vehicles back in the day. And so all of that stuff uh, are things that the Office of Naval Research took, took part in. And uh, we're charting the course for the next 75 years right now. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, President Rondo mentioned this, but but ONR is a part of this Naval Research Enterprise. So Naval Research Enterprise consists of ONR, again, which is which is the office that I actually sit in in Arlington. We have an organization, ONR Global, which has headquarters in London. And then we have offices um, in Tokyo. And then we've got one or two science directors in different embassies or consulates all over the all over the globe. Um, and and we're, we're right now trying to get into India. So we're trying to expand our presence there. Naval Research Laboratory, which was established on July 1st, 2020, or 1923. So it's coming up on its 100th anniversary here in a couple of years. So that's had a long story uh, history as well. Very, very prominent work, radar stuff going into World War II, a lot of stuff with satellites, GPS, amazing technology, atomic clocks, just, and it continues. And then PMR 51, and they do a lot of uh, sensitive work. So we're not gonna really go into that here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, as I talk about what ONR does, you know, like anything else, we've got we're divvied it up into different departments. And but you, you think of what we do is everything from the seabed to space, and, and literally. I mean, we actually make payloads out at the Naval Research Laboratory, which fly on satellites routinely. Um, we actually fly satellites from different tracking stations that we have. One in Maryland, where we actually fly satellites uh, for uh, for for o for NRL and for other parts of the government, um, and those are actually being done autonomously. So those command centers where these satellites are flown are, are not manned. Uh, people go home at night, they, they come back during the day, uh, but no one's there 24 seven. People actually get 
text on their phones when problems occur. <laughs> so it's, it's a whole new world. But anyway, this is kind of how we're arranged. So on the left, obviously, it's electronic warfare stuff. Then you got ocean battle space. That's oceanography. It's our subsea type stuff. In the middle of that air, aircraft area picture, we still are looking hard at some of the whole mechanical electrical systems, pumps, valves, those kind of things. Because again, like anything else, the technology, even there advances. Advanced manufacturing is a whole focus area for that uh, Perform or that uh, portfolio. Warfighter performance looks at the human aspects of warfighting, human endurance. Uh, how do you augment human strength? How does the brain function? How do we make decisions? Artificial intelligence is a part of that. That's that's that branch. And then aviation force projection and integrated defense. Hypersonics is in here. Advanced next generation fighters is in here, as well as a directed energy portfolio is in here. Lasers, rail guns, other things is in, in that arena. Naval accelerator across the bottom is our newest code, code 36. This has got things like Naval X, tech bridges in it. It's looking at how do we actually get into the venture capital space, office of private investment. How do we do that stuff? So that's part of that, that branch right there. Next slide, please. So we're also part of this larger enterprise, uh, the Naval Research and Development Establishment. So you can see on the far right there, that's the NRA that I just spoke to. But the rest of this are the warfare centers. And then you can see across the bottom, the UARCs, FRDC, and also the Naval Postgrad address school you can see there. So this is the Naval Research and Development Establishment. We are trying, we, myself and Ms. Johnson, uh, the DASN RDT&E, uh, JJ, we are trying hard to really bring this ecosystem into tighter alignment. Uh, so as we come up with ideas in the 6.12 and 3, which is the early science and technology arena that I work in, those ideas can more easily flow into parts of the rest of the Naval Research and Development Establishment to, to further mature those TRL levels to get the technology ready to go to a program or to the field. Uh, this is really important to try to tighten this up. A lot of great work already goes on across this entire enterprise. It's not as well coordinated as, as it needs to be, and that's, that's a big thing we're focusing on. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to now pivot into talking about technology. So, uh, you know, think about uh, think about your history. Uh, World War II, obviously, a pivotal moment in naval history, uh, world history, but also naval history. When uh, when Admiral Nimitz was at CNO at the end of World War II, he had the largest fleet on the planet by an order. I mean, just tens, incredible magnitude beyond any other nation, all nations combined. In fact. But even then, he recognized that the Navy was going to change. And what the future Navy will be like, we cannot say as yet. I think that's pretty profound. This is part of a much longer uh, quotation where he talks about the array of assets that he had, but then even reflects on the changes that even happened between 1939 and you know 1945 or 46. Those were profound changes. I mean, think about the things that happened. Radar systems, advancements in sonar systems, obviously submarine warfare. I mean, just tremendous changes. Obviously, jet airplanes that came out of uh, V2 rockets from Germany. Uh, advancements were just beyond belief. Well, think what's happened since then. It's, it's accelerated even further. And again, I think uh, even though all those advancements that happened from you know, the end of World War II to today are phenomenal, tremendous. I think we're right on the verge of yet another acceleration. Let's go to, I think the next slide is my video.
Okay, <clears throat> so as that graphic started, as that video started, um, you know, it, it goes back about 10,000 years. Okay, that's when agriculture, you know, humans kind of figured out how to store food, store energy, right? So that was a that was a pivotal moment. And, you know, you can think prior to that, uh, you know, all history prior to that, you know, there was some local farming that happened. It's not saying it didn't happen. It did. But um, but for the most part, humans were pretty much anchored to wherever they were born. They didn't they, they didn't move a lot. I mean, there was some migration, but not on a scale that really happened after we really kind of cracked the agriculture nut. <laughs> yeah, I know. But once we could do that, store food, you can now last through long drought periods, long winter months. You can now take that food with you and move and go to far locations and replant which, whatever you brought with you and grow again. That was a pivotal moment in history. This is a graphic that, that I've spoken to and some of you who've seen me speak before have seen this, uh, but this is from a book that I that I just love called The Second Machine Age. Uh, and again, this is a book that actually Alan Richardson, when he was the, the uh, director of Naval Nuclear Reactors, uh, when I was a baby one star, we're doing my first mentoring session with him, uh, he told me, you know, I started talking about my view of where thought technology was going uh, and how it was changing so rapidly. He said to me, hey, have you read The Second Machine Age because you're describing some of that book? I was like, I was like no. He said, well, you, you didn't read that. So you're like any good one star who's seen for the first time when ordered that book that same day and it came a couple days later and I read, read it in about a, a week. But this graph is in that book and I love this graph and uh, I can riff on this for a long time. The left-hand scale is Human Social Development Index. This is kind of your capacity for doing stuff. Okay, so think back, back to, you know, 8,000 BC, like it shows on here, it's pretty low, right? So it's, that's, you know, like, like 10 or something. It's, you know, that scale is, it's the mag, it's the deltas that really matter, not the number, but, but it's low. So think of life back in those days, okay? Uh, let's go back even further, 20,000 BC. I mean, you, how, you can go way back to the beginning of, of human time on this planet, but, but the bottom line is back in those times, uh, your day was basically consumed by a couple things. Okay, woke up, you're probably hungry. So job one, find food. Well, guess what? Finding food before agriculture took you like all day because you were foraging for roots and berries and maybe then you got some, some poor animal walked along your path, you were able to club it and eat it, who knows? But it took you all day. So by the time you got done, you know, filling your belly, guess what? The sun is going down. So what's job two? Find shelter. Got to find shelter because if I don't find shelter, the third thing happens. You become food. So you got to prevent yourself from becoming food. So it's like a defensive thing. So that's that's three things. That's like your whole life. The sun's down. You got to go to bed now. So um, as a result, the fourth thing didn't happen very often. And if it did, the infant mortality was so low that population just was flat. So see that? It's totally flatlined, that whole period. Very, very low-level millions. The right-hand scale is population. So human population was basically self-sustaining at a very low level for a very, very long time. It starts to go up here. You know, around the conventional era, it pops up, flattens out again, goes down a little dip. There's some plagues and things that happen in there. But something really drastic happens in the late 1700s. And the book ties this to the Industrial Revolution. I think they're right. And right here, you can see James Watt perfects the steam engine in 1781. He didn't invent the steam engine. He perfected it. He, he basically figured out how to close the loop, condense the steam, and recycle it back into the, back into the boiler. So that was a pivotal moment in, in history because for the first time, you were not wedded to either wind or water, water for a water wheel or even water for a water source for that steam engine. You can now put that steam engine kind of anywhere you want it. Think factories, think buildings. And that's what kind of happened. And as soon as you had this machine doing the work of many, many humans, okay, uh, and not, not a horse doing the, the work of, you know, a few humans or even 50 humans, a machine, hundreds, you know, it's like hundreds of horsepower, thousands of horsepower. First time, we actually all of a sudden got something back we did not have in a long time, and that was time. Okay, so up to this whole time in history, we toiled all day long, either finding food, working in the field, working agriculture. It was an all-day thing. Sun up, sun down. Sun went down, didn't have a lot of light sources back in the day, maybe some oil lamps here and there, but you didn't really stay up studying. You slept. You ate, you slept. Uh, but all of a sudden here, when the Industrial Revolution kicks off, you're all of a sudden granted this plethora of time. And that was used to think and ponder 
and reflect on what can I do to make my life better, which is like, it's a human endeavor. I mean, that's what we all do. How do I make my life better? We're all still doing, trying to do that today. When you have time, you actually start inventing and innovations just took off. And that's what this is trying to show you. Uh, and just think about all the things that happened in the 18 and 1900s. I mean, it's just obvious things like jets and submarines, got it. But think about things like, you know, the wireless, communications, electrification, telephones, light bulbs. I mean, just tremendous. Refrigeration. Just think about that. You know, middle of the 1800s, refrigeration comes along. For the first time, we're not relying upon a block of ice to keep our food, you know, preserved. So human health condition went up tremendously when we figured out refrigeration. And then think about all the medical advancements we, we came up with. All the pharmaceuticals, you know, penicillin, just antibiotics. I mean, just incredible. Anyway, I, I love this graph because it tells a tremendous story. Uh, I could go on here, but I think I think it's your time. Let's let's press on. Let's let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the video talked a little bit about, you know, the epic moments in history. And so, again, I do think this is a pivotal moment. And I, I think quantum age, that maybe that's a stretch. I don't, I don't know. I'm a nuclear guy. I, I don't think so. I think there's really something to that. But I think if you look at all the things that you're hearing in the news, artificial intelligence, China wants to be the world leader by 2030. Putin says whoever wins the AI race first will dominate the, you know, dominate the planet. Um Clearly, there's a link between that and autonomy. Autonomous systems is obviously a huge focus area for, for us as a Navy and Marine Corps team. Uh, biotechnology, this is this is something that, well, the pharmaceuticals and, and, you know, they're looking at it. It's not something that we've looked at on the military side until very recently. I think this has got tremendous, tremendous potential. There are some people that estimate that you can actually, with biological means, manufacture roughly 60% of the of the stuff we use today, wood, plastic, even some forms of, you know, hard, maybe not metals, but harder materials that can be used for structural components. That's pretty, uh, that could be tremendously impactful to the world's economy and to military logistics uses as well. So that's a whole nother area. And then of course, quantum, I mean, right on top, quantum. And this is not just quantum computing. This is quantum sensing, quantum timing, quantum networking, quantum communications, uh, I, I do think quantum and and quantum computing, of course, and I do think as, as artificial intelligence advances, there will be a point where there's a, a natural convergence with quantum computing and quantum, quantum computations, because uh, classical is just not going to be enough. Uh, uh, and I think quantum's got a, a role that they will actually help us. Um, but I think we're on the door of some of these major moments here. Let's go to the next slide, and, that, and I'm going to use that. To, oh, oh, yes, this slide. Okay, so... A lot of people ask me about the, um, you know, transition of technology, right? Um, and, you know, they always talk about the valley of death, okay? And, and the valley of death occurs when an idea comes from basic research, goes through the 6.1, 2, and 3. Uh, you've, you've applied the technology to some military application. You mature the TRL level to about 5 or 6. That's about where ONR takes it. Because that's just, that's about where our, our type of type of money we have can take technology. Well, there's a break there, and you've got to figure out, okay, now who's going to take this technology on? Which means you've got to get a sponsor that wants to take it on, and that would be usually a program office. Okay, so that valley of death, in this case, is being described as the cliffs of insanity, the cliffs of acquisition. Someone recently told me, hey, it's not actually a valley of death; it's actually a moat the mode of despair that's dug intentionally around the PEO by the program managers and it's filled with alligators to keep the high risk s and stuff out because we present risk to a program because they're trying to keep things on cost schedule performance, cost schedule are the really the dominant players. And as a result, new ideas, that's risk. And that could, that could screw up your schedule, could screw up your budget. Uh, it's also a cliff. So you can, you can describe it as a moat or as a cliff. But I love this this reference. You can see up on top there the the nice gray hole fleet that's in that uh, beautiful blue ocean up there, uh, protected by this incredible cliff of uh, you know it's hard to get those good ideas up. That's there's some truth to this. There's a lot of friction in this system today, uh, and that's why I've been on a journey for several years now, uh, talking about I think if we're going to be able to deal with this technology that's racing ahead at the pace that's racing ahead. We've got to make some structural changes. This is no longer about acquisition reform and adding another special authority to an already complex and ambiguous process. This is about actually restructuring the way we're organized to get after this. Because I think until we do that, I think we're going to continue to struggle to bring advanced technologies into our 
existing systems. Uh, and to get to something disruptive is even harder. It just is. Uh, but to do that, you have to have people who are willing to take risk, like these guys. Next slide. Oh, yeah, I did it to myself again. All right, I, re I reshuffled here a couple of days ago. All right, well, to get to this, you have to have a team of teams. And part of the team of teams concept, and if you guys haven't read this book, uh, Stanley McChrystal, General McChrystal's Team of Teams. You can see I've read this thing. I love this book. It's all, I got all kinds of writing in here and tabs in here. This book tells you how you bring uh, teams of disparate people with diverse thinking, diverse backgrounds together to solve incredibly complex problems. That's the world we live in today. We can no longer be stovepipe trying to think that our team can solve this problem by ourselves. No, we are way beyond that. We've got to network ourselves. You've got to tie these networks together, both formally and really more importantly, informally. Relationships, people talking together. The leadership has to help open those doors, allow that, and make sure that's an expectation of the way you do business. But until you do that, you're not going to solve those highly complex problems. Okay, now the next slide that I was thinking was up. Okay. So these are just two examples of many uh, of people who took a lot of risk uh, to and because they recognize that if we didn't make some phenomenal changes, structural changes, we were never going to advance the football down the field. Vannevar Bush on the left, uh, World War II is kicking off. He's at MIT. He resigns and goes down to, to D.C. and somehow walks in and gets a meeting with President Roosevelt and convinces him that we need to have an organization dedicated to science and technology or we were going to lose World War II. And he got it. And coming out of that, all the things I talked about, radar, advanced, you know, it's early computing comes out of this thing. Manhattan Project actually comes out of this thing and it becomes its own thing, but it came out of this kind of a, a approach. Obviously, you know, the guy on the right is Hyman Rickover. We'd never, nuclear, we'd never have a nuclear submarine with, probably without his efforts. I mean, we may, may have gotten there decades later. But the timeline on which he operated was just beyond belief. Someone else who's not on here is a guy who took one of these. Can you look at this very carefully here? Okay. You guys know what that is? That's a that's a phone, a flip phone back in the day. And all of a sudden, you got one of these. This is a, this goes to a museum. This is my first iPhone. And believe it or not, I have all my old iPhones over here. My wife hates that, but I've got them all. It's, I think it's kind of cool. So this is an iPhone. Okay. And I, this is a 3GS. I've even got the nice box that came in because I think these Apple boxes are so cool. But this, this is disruptive. Okay. So this is a technology that because you grew up with this, like guys like me did, you didn't even know you needed this until someone stuck it in your hand. And once you got this in your hand, you, you didn't think you could live without it. And I think that's true. I, and it goes to, you know, and here we are today with the, the 12, you know, the 12. I, I, you know, you can't live without it. That's what disruptive technologies are. Nuclear submarines. Didn't even know you needed one until you, until you got one. Now we can't live without it. What's the next thing? What's the next thing on the plate that's going to be in that category of disruption that a warfighter is going to say, I didn't know I needed this, but now that I've got it, I'm not giving it back and I'm not going to live without it. That's the kind of things that we at the Austin Naval Research are looking for, to try to put those ideas into the minds and hands of warfighters to ensure that we are never in an, a fair fight with anybody. Okay, we're gonna, that, that's the goal, that's the goal which we're trying to do. It is getting more challenging, but that's what we're trying to do. All right, I'm mindful of time. I'm looking at it here. I think I've taken my 20 minutes and I, I really want to get to questions. So with that, Jeff, Jeff to you or whoever the moderator is for this one. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir, Admiral yeah. Salvi, for your, your thought-provoking comments and leadership on these issues. Uh, I'm delighted now to welcome our student team who have questions for you. We have four students from various curricula and service backgrounds uh, who are eager to contribute. And I'll start with Lieutenant Commander Curran. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Brian Curran is a combat systems engineering duty officer and in recent years has completed tours at NSWC Port Wanimi, OPTEB 4, and the Missile Defense Agency. After initially graduating from NPS in 2012 with master's degrees in applied physics and mechanical engineering, uh, an obvious underachiever, he has uh, returned to pursue his PhD in applied physics. He, his planned dissertation research will focus on modeling beam propagation for the ultra short pulse laser. Lieutenant Commander Curran, over to you. Good afternoon, Admiral. So, a uh, quick question is, uh, with uh, laser weapon systems such as ODIN and SSLTM being installed and tested on ships, 
It is clear that directed energy will become increasingly important in our Navy's future. What do you see as the role of directed energy in 20 years? And uh, how will it change how we and other navies fight? Yeah, so it's it's pretty clear if you look at, uh, you've talked about ODIN, um, you look at some of the other work we're doing at ONR to advance laser systems. Um, POIWS is really is all in on installing lasers on our destroyers. So I think in 20 years, you're going to see some type of laser on every combatant in the fleet and probably on some of our non-combatants or logistic ships as well to protect them. I think additionally, you'll see them in shore bases, uh, shore locations around the planet. Um, you'll see higher energy levels as we progress with that technology. And I'm not going to speak about levels, but they're going to continue to advance uh, over time here. But I'll tell you, um, lasers, while they're phenomenal, they do. I think they're going to be doing uh, even more uh, self-defense work than they're doing now. Clearly now we're taking out things like, you know, quadcopters and, and, and slow moving UAVs uh, that will advance to uh, higher stressing threats. I'll just say it that way. Um, so that will continue. But this is just one of the solutions we'll have. Okay? It's one arrow in the quiver and the quiver of our systems on our ships, defensive and offensive, needs to be very diverse because there, there will be some aspects of this that somebody may figure out one day, and you don't want to just be single thread on one solution. And so uh, they'll, again, 20 years, every platform is going to have uh, some type of laser system, as well as other systems that will go along with it to complement. The, the, the trick and the, uh, you know, the magic sauce, as it were, is going to be in how you direct those and how you determine which of those arrows in your quiver takes out which threat and how you prioritize and how the human basically has to stand back and allow the system to work because we cannot make a decision fast enough for the kind of threats that I'm thinking about. But that's that 20 years, you'll see them everywhere. Great, thank you. Um, our next uh, student is uh, Captain Mike Gannon. And Mike uh, grew up in Dayton, Ohio and enlisted in the Marine Corps in 2007. He commissioned through the Marine Enlisted College Education Program, graduating from the University of Maryland College Park in 2016 with a bachelor's degree in military history and diplomacy. He graduated from Norwich University in 2019 with a master's degree in United States military history. He is a manpower officer and will graduate here in March 2022 with a degree in manpower systems analysis. His thesis research is focused on the cost effectiveness and efficacy of leveraging computer aided instruction in DOD schoolhouses and he recently presented his research at the NPS Big Ideas Exchange in 2021 on May 14th. Captain Gannon, over to you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Admiral. Good afternoon. My question, sir, is has two parts. In the immediate near future um, in uh, technology, what is the number one research priority that we cannot fall behind on compared to China and Russia? And then in the long term, the 10 to 25 year range out, um, which is almost unpredictable. Um, what do you think that next step of research would be? Yeah, so, I mean, you heard me speak to the, a lot of the different epic moments. So quantum AI, autonomous systems, biotechnology, uh, microelectronics will probably go in those the, that bin as well. Uh, whether it's neuromorphic processing or just establishing a, a domestic uh, you know, foundry that we could actually rely upon that's not somewhere overseas. But I think it's it's very dangerous to try to bet on even, even two, even three. Uh, and that's the value of having a diverse portfolio like the Office of Resource manages. Um, you know, we look across a vast array of technologies uh, because you just you just never know uh, which one uh, may come to fruition 5, 10, 15, or to your point, 25 years out. And so as a result, we find it's better to actually uh, have a wider and maybe a little shallower depth to your investments than having a very, you know, very narrow and very deep investments. Because again, invariably, you'll bet wrong and you'll, you know, you're going to bet on Betamax instead of, you know, VHF. VHS and, and here we are now on Blu-ray, but that's the that's the issue. You've got to have a wide view. Uh, clearly, the ones I mentioned are high focus areas because we do think there's a lot of game changing game changing potential behind things like artificial intelligence, quantum biotechnology. Um, but again, I would be I'd be reticent to say here's one or two because uh, I don't think that's the way it works. Here's what I would say though. I think the, the best investment we can make in this country is in STEM, is developing STEM talent. Now, 
I, I'm not talking, all of you are not STEM people, I got that, I, I understand that. But uh, I think if you look at the world we live in today, with technology is really the driving force behind the changes I think we're gonna see over the next decade without fail. We have got to develop STEM talent. And that starts in that starts in kindergarten, it starts in middle school. It's got to continue through high school, in the college, in a PhD level even, and, and then into the workforce, whether that's for me, some other part of the government or industry, that is critically important. If we don't develop that talent, then we will fail. That talent is what will rule the day for this century, uh, because I'm convinced uh, with the right minds, a diverse team, and especially a team that is like, like Americans, we like to talk, we like to exchange ideas, we like free flow of information. That is the value of what this society, combined with those bright minds, can bring to bear, and we can have another resurgence in technological prowess that will rule this entire century if we do this right. Leadership also has to be steeped in, in some of these STEM fun, found, uh, foundational ideas as well. Not all of us, but a large percentage of us that can understand the complexities of the world we live in today. Uh, actually, uh, Admiral Rondo shot me an article yesterday the day before that talked about actually Army and STEM, STEM uh, percentage of their general officers, and it's fairly low. Uh, ours is probably higher. I, I didn't go find the number yet, but, but it may not be high enough. I don't know. That's an important thing because the decisions we're making today are primarily technical decisions, and we've got to have people that understand that. Now, I also understand the value of, again, I said diversity. Diversity of thought is also important. So having history majors and econ majors, English majors is also good because you do a lot of times get different perspectives. It's a balance. But again, STEM talent is critical. So I think if we get that right, then it won't matter. You, won't, you don't have to pick the one because we'll have enough folks with diverse backgrounds that are thinking about different things. And that's what really will allow us to uh, continue to do things we're doing today. Great, thank you. Um, our next student is Major Sean Batson. He's an Air Force Intelligence Weapons Officer in the Northeast Asia Foreign Area Officer Training Pipeline. He's a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Weapons School, where he was also an instructor. A prior enlisted air crew member, he graduated from American Military University with a bachelor's in Middle Eastern Studies and a master's degree in Strategic Intelligence. After graduation, he will attend the Defense Language Institute Japanese Special Projects course, and he will be assigned to the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command J-5 Strategic Plans and Policy Directorate. Major Batson, over to you. Thank you, sir. Admiral Selby, thank you for your time on behalf of the Air Force Element here at Naval Postgraduate School. So you mentioned the infrastructure that Apple uh, brought on board with the with the iPhone as well as the, the uh, internet of things that they bring in their infrastructure. Uh, I think that's a really interesting uh, viewpoint here because as the services are each building cutting edge technical solutions to support joint all uh, domain command and control efforts, uh, I'm very curious to know how the uh, uh, Naval Research Enterprise is able to integrate open mission standards. In other words, how can Space Force assets pass target data to those shipborne lasers that you spoke of in a language uh, that uh, all players understand? And, and how are we as a force developing that in our acquisitions in, in science and technology? Yeah, no, <clears throat> great question. So a um, couple of thoughts on that. Uh, one, uh, I think digital engineering uh, needs to be foundational to everything we do going forward. Okay, so and this is this is not just using like CAD CAM, you know, high-end 3D, you know, design tools. This is actually uh, really tying a thread between everything from our initial concept formulation, model-based system engineering development into those high dimensional design tools, but then flowing the right elements of that into some uh, OQE, objective quality evidence that can be maintained for the life of the, the thing, whether it's a ship, a comm circuit, a network, a waveform, whatever it is. So you can maintain configuration control, you can ensure that the standards that you use at the interfaces is uh, is understood by those that need to understand it. Not everybody, but you know, for in this in your discussion, Air Force and Navy would have the same basically uh, standards that we're working towards. So as we plug these things in, they will actually be able to exchange information and data and not have to do some kind of work around or. God forbid they won't even work at all. So I think digital engineering is foundational to that. Uh, another piece of this is actually working with some of the, the national and international standard bodies to ensure that uh, there is some 
norms that are put in place because some of the stuff uh, you do want to be open and you want to have outsiders helping us with this, whether it's small businesses or large. And so uh, we're actually working with NIST on some of these digital engineering standards I've talked about. The great news is that the automotive and the aircraft manufacturers are really hot in this area as well, and they're helping drive this as well. And so while we've come in with some thoughts and got the ball going several years ago, they've actually really continued to carry this football, which I think is a really important one. So I think that's critically important as well. Uh, the other piece of this is th don't forget our international partners because they're also critical to this, uh, this future, whether it's deterrence or a fight if we get into one. Um, there's a discussion right now that's ongoing between uh, the N US Navy and the Royal Navy in particular, and now also the Australian uh, Navy has jumped in on this as well. And it's this idea of interchangeability. Okay, so we've talked about interoperability for years, okay? And interoperable, well, I mean, you know, some form of communication back and forth, maybe be able to exchange even text data back and forth, but it, it's not tremendously more than that, unfortunately. Interchangeability is actually a much more integrated concept, and this is much more of a kind of what, you're, what we're trying to get at with our own forces, being able to not just exchange you know, communications kind of information, but track quality data, uh, maybe even engineering data, maybe even have a system that I can launch from a U.S. asset, autonomous system, maybe it flies over the horizon and it lands on a Royal Navy asset and you can not only control it, you can recharge it, you can download the data, upload new data, upload a new mission, launch it off again, and maybe it ping pongs back to the U.S. asset or goes somewhere else. That's a much different level of of, uh, of engineering rigor and complexity and data standards you have to get after to get to interchangeability. But that's a discussion we're really getting after with with against some of our key allies because we think that's about the, that's really critical to the future. The best way to do that is to start at the beginning, even in the S and T world, and develop these ideas together. And we may use you know U.S. companies on the U.S. side and U.K. companies on the U.K. side. But if we work together with project arrangements and other international agreements, we can over time, as we develop these systems, actually have systems that are interchangeable. And so that's what we're trying to get after. And that's a, that's all kind of a whole new concept. But it's it's I think critically important to this international partnership that we need to get after going forward. Hope that answered. Uh, at least some of your questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, sir. Our fourth uh, student panelist is Captain Rebecca Riopel. She is a USMC Northeast Asia Foreign Area Officer in the 682 curriculum at NPS, headed to the American Institute of Taiwan, AIT, for her next duty assignment after DLI Mandarin study. Prior to NPS, Captain Riopel served as the Marine Aircraft Group 12 adjutant, adjutant Sorry, at Iokuna, Japan, uh, planning and participating in large-scale exercises, Valiant Shield 2018 in Guam, as well as Belakatan 2019 in the Philippines, supervising accountability for 800-plus personnel. Prior to that, she served as Marine Corps Recruit Depot Paris Island as the 4th Recruit Training Battalion Series Commander. Captain Riopel, over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Admiral. Good. This question uh, kind of pertains to your slide to do with the cliffs of acquisition. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, I'll just mention it in two parts here. At the major subordinate command level, how can our military units keep up with the technological revolution as many of our current assets and capabilities take significant time to phase out? At what level, whether this is weapons capabilities, for example, the F-35, surveillance, uh, phones or computers, or quantum sensing or computing, can risk be assumed? Yeah. Um, often this phasing process is highly complex, tied to our career paths for our service members, as well as varying funding pipelines and procedural delays. So in short, how can the military keep up with the technological revolution? Yeah, that's a great question, and that that is the uh, that is a struggle that I've been I've been fighting here for several years, and uh, and again I I think it a lot of this a lot of challenge we have comes out of the fact that that our acquisition system today is really tuned for um, the Soviet Union, okay, and and what I mean by that is it so it really comes out of the the 1980s um, when we were at the height of the the Cold War. 
And uh, we were trying to put out some, you know, fairly, for the day, fairly complex warships um, and aircraft. And it really, well, and also, this is a key point, the, the adversary, the Soviet Union in this case, was economically inferior. In fact, economically backwards. I mean, they were going the wrong way, tremendously the wrong way. They, they were pretty much bankrupt. Uh, and technologically, uh, they were inferior. Now, they had some areas of expertise, don't get me wrong, but, but overall, they could not they could not keep up with the technology uh, that race that we were on okay so as a result of that uh, we actually had much more time to, to to go through the you know Jason's problem the things we do today that go through the acquisition process um, the problem today is that that the primary adversary we're you know worried about is China who is economically about to you know about to overtake us if they haven't already and uh, technologically uh, Pretty much on par, and maybe in some areas, some would argue it already eclipsed us. Okay, that's a tremendously different ballgame. Tremendously different ballgame. The acquisition system we have today, uh, you're incentivized for maintaining stability, right? Cost schedule are dominant. You want to keep things at cost and on schedule. Performance is important, but that actually is the first thing that it will trade if you can save cost or schedule. Uh, and, and that's just the reality. I mean, I've lived this life now. I mean, I'm, I think I'm one of the, I think I'm the only flag officer who's actually lived every end of acquisition. I mean, I was a commanding officer of submarine, so I was the ultimate customer. I was a program manager a couple times. I've been a resource sponsor in the Pentagon doing the JSONs process, AOAs and ICDs and all that fun stuff. Uh, I was the chief engineer doing all the design work and all the maintenance stuff that had to happen. And then I was the Warfare Center commander where all the R&D and in-service support happens. And now I'm the chief of the research. So I've kind of seen it end to end. And I, yeah, we're just not aligned, right? Uh, or is it still okay for the big complex things? Yeah, I, arguably, I think, yeah. Uh, but I think for the other stuff, I think not. Apple, I was just actually reading about Apple uh, last night. Um, interesting, so they are organized functionally, okay? Instead of being organized by a product line, kind of like we are, so we're organized by product lines, right? We have a syscom that's focused on ships. We have a syscom that's focused on, you know, comms and cyber. We have a syscom that's focused on airplanes. That's a product line. And even within in that, it's even more subjugation of, of product lines. Apple has chosen to stay uh, functionally aligned. So design, engineering, hardware, software. That's a different model. And our, Apple argues that to deliver anything, all those teams have to work together. And while there might be micro teams that get broken out and work on particular products, they still go back to their home, you know, functional area to stay plugged in with the rest of that functional area. That's kind of the model that I think we need to get to. That's where I, that's where my head's at. Um, and again, for the first time in my career, I'm actually starting to hear some very senior folks ask the hard questions that I think are kind of scratching at this very issue. Uh, but to your point, how do you do this now? So we, we, it's like we're flying an airplane. If I'm going to remodel and reconstruct it, I got to keep it flying. I can't, I can't land it because we've got to keep delivering submarines and planes and all this other stuff. So I think we have to have some, uh, maybe some parallel paths that get after these technology, fast moving technology uh, components that we're trying to put on these things. Some of it we have functional areas already. But we got to put a little more grease on the on the gears because it, they're still too clogged. Some of this has to do with who's controlling the money, where's the money sit. So some of that has to be managed. You've got uh, the predominant amount of six four and beyond R and D money is really in the PEO lane. It's not it's not even in my lane. And so again, I get the thing material five or six ish, but before the PEO is going to want to use it in a program, he wants it at eight or nine. He or she wants an eight or nine. So there's got to be some delta of funding applied to get that done. So there's some ideas that are that I've got going right now. I've got a Pathfinder effort that I'm kind of putting together to go show me a different way of doing business. Part of this is also how we set requirements. So uh, today we set requirements. Uh, and when you think about what's the next ship going to look like or airplane going to look like, it doesn't look much different than the last one. Okay. And it's so much because... I think it's our the way we're kind of wedded to our existing programs. We we have more incremental improvements than we have disruptive improvements. So I'm kind of trying to change that around and let's let's define the problem. So let's define the problem we're trying to solve first. And then let's go seek solutions and let's seek very broadly, not just your your your, your top five normal performers. Let's cast that net as wide as you can cast it. Small business, maybe even go international. Let's look at academics. 
come up with those ideas, and then let's go try some. And then, and then, and only then, set the requirement, and then get the RFP out and go build this in, in numbers. That's where I think we need to go. So I've got some things I'm trying to go do to prove that that might be a better way to go. And again, maybe not for the big, big gray sub, so ships and submarines, but for some of these smaller things, attributable systems. I think there's a whole thing we've got to get into. Attributable, you know, autonomous systems. Things you may only use once and then you never use it again. Maybe use it for a year, but you don't plan to do a overhaul because you're not going to use it long enough and you're going to recycle it before you get to that point or you'll lose it. And if you lose it, you haven't spent that much on it. I think that's where we need to go. And think more about the software, not the hardware. Make it about software. Really make this about AI. Don't spend as much on the hardware. Put a ton of processing in it or a bunch of, uh, you know, comm circuits to backhaul the information and then apply the analytics to the to the data. That's where we need to go. That's that's the future vision for me. But the problem you're describing is exactly the problem that I've been just living for the last 14 or 15 years. And, and just it's screaming for an alternate solution here. And that's that's the structural thing I'm talking about. We got to we got to get after that. But anyway, that's that's a lot. I give you a lot there. But that's great. It's a great question. I'm glad you see it, too, because it's pretty clear to me. Something's got to change. Thank you, sir. So you're going to Taiwan. Yes, sir. That's correct. That's I get to do uh, some language study first. so. Yeah. You know, hopefully uh, by the time I'm there, I'm not uh, at risk of China taking Taiwan or something. <laughs> exactly. Well, we got to we got to deter that one. That's yeah, we got to keep that stability. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to start around again and and uh, and ask uh, Lieutenant Commander Curran to uh, maybe uh, provide a second question. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Admiral, sir. So. You mentioned earlier in your presentation, uh, you, you mentioned hypersonics a couple of times, and we often hear about hypersonic weapons and how they're an emerging and uniquely challenging threat. Um, so the question is essentially, how do you think they will change the future of naval warfare? And importantly for us, how can we get involved as uh, military officers in shaping this future? Yeah, so I, hypersonics, I mean, this is not really a new thing, right? Hypersonics have been around for a while. I mean, now we're clearly in the last four or five years, uh, you know, we've I guess had a renaissance in hypersonics and we're kind of really getting back into it because we see the utility, we see what this can do for uh, for us. And oh, by the way, we're seeing others like China uh, and Russia really put a lot in this area. So, well, what can it do for us? Well, I mean, clearly it's the time, it's the time distance thing, right? So I can, I, I got long, like long reach and I can get stuff there fast. And so uh, it's gonna, two things. One, it's gonna give you a, a much uh, extended offensive reach uh, again, with that very short time horizon, um, it could potentially give you some highly maneuverable capability, which is hard to counter. Uh, but from a defensive perspective, it, it makes it hard for whoever's on the receiving end of this, whether it's us or, or them, uh, to deal with. So it's going to really confuse and confound the, the defensive uh, systems that you put in place. So a couple things on this. So I think it's going to totally change some of our concepts, our, our concept operations, our tactics, techniques, and procedures, the way you employ weapon systems. Um, it clearly is, uh, you know, again, I talked about the reach, but but the time aspect is what's really cool. I mean, just the fact you can reach out and and touch someone in freaking minutes, uh, device maybe maybe tens of minutes or even hours, and that is pretty impactful. Uh, the defensive side, it's going to change a lot of things too. And I think uh, that again, in order to counter these kind of systems, you are going to have to totally trust uh, the the combat system and the and the uh, you know human machine teaming aspect of AI that's going to have to be employed to counter these systems. You just do not have the time uh, to to think that you can fat finger a button to do it. It's not going to happen. So I think it'll accelerate some of this adoption of these technologies. Now that means on the on our side, on the s and side, the engineering side, we gotta get this right. Gotta get this right uh, because we've gotta build this trust between the human, you know, that ship CEO or that that aircraft commander uh, and, and his or her weapon system. We gotta build that trust. Uh, but it, I think it's gonna accelerate some of this adoption of those tools, but it's gonna open a whole new host of tactics, techniques and procedures that uh, will be employed by, you know, folks like like, like all of you on the uh, on the teams here. Uh, sir, thank you. Um, we are nearing the end of the hour. Do you have time for one more question? Uh, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Let me then uh, ask uh, Captain Gannon to uh, provide the final question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, 
Sir, I want to ask about, so the DOD has the Rapid Innovation Fund that the ONR and all the branches uh, utilize. What can ONR do to create a, a rapid thesis fund for year-round funding of theses? So when we have service members from the fleet forces come to a school, they have pragmatic solutions for today's problems, and they want to develop that into a thesis, take it and return a big impact back to the fleet, uh, you know, a big idea, if you will. Um, what, what can we do to, to have funding available year round? Because right now we're sort of tied to the, the budgetary system and when, when the Naval Research Program and when certain deadlines and hit, but we're checking in and uh, year round and we're developing thesis ideas and concepts year round, not around a um, fiscal schedule, unfortunately. Yeah, that, well, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, and, you know, I, I have uh, been talking to my my team about, hey, let's make sure we're, you know, we're casting our net wide, too. Uh, and that includes folks like like you guys in NPS. And I've also oftentimes said to my team that, hey, it's also nice to get a warfighter's perspective on what we're thinking. And I said, hey, there's a whole cadre of warfare officers out at the Naval Post Grant School that have just come from the fleet or the Marine Forces and are going back. Uh, in, in many cases, and so that's a great place. So this idea, though, of a uh, of some kind of a fund for a thesis project. Okay, so what are we going to call it here? Gonna, what's it? Uh, the Michael Gannon uh, fund here. We're going to figure this one out. I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pose that to my team and have to talk to uh, I'll have to talk to Jeff and uh, President Rondo here about this idea. It's an interesting idea. I I, uh, I do, but I do feel your pain because I do understand because you guys come in all times at different times of year. And if there's uh, if you're out of alignment with whatever the grant process is or the funding palm process, uh, I I feel like I I personally feel like pain even now because even right now I go into the job a year ago and I get there and I'm like hey I want to do all these things they're like oh Apple look palm 22 is already that's already in the building but you can influence palm 23 I'm like 23 that's I'm gonna like be done by then what do you mean 23 so I feel your pain I, that's an idea I'm gonna put that in my I'll put that in my brain and talk to my team about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Admiral Selby, that was the final question. Uh, thank you and thanks to our student leaders who joined us with their great questions. And now I hand it back to Admiral Rondo for some final thoughts and, and wrap up. President Rondo. Thank you, Dr. Um, Padawan. So Admiral, uh, you need to know that in the chat, uh, uh, many of Mike's colleagues, uh, of Captain Gannon's colleagues, thought that maybe they needed to call the, his idea Mike's money. So we do a lot of it of incentivizing here about good ideas. But you know, so Captain Gannon is one of so many of our students who have come up with really good thoughts and ideas and initiatives. And he was part of our briefing at, at the big ideas exchange about two weeks ago and, and was all good. Uh, Abel, prior to signing off, uh, some last words from you, sir, that might be useful about leadership and about how you, how you, you see the future, sir. Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank, uh, thank you, President Rondo, thank the entire team here, Jeff, uh, and all the students that are on here asking me questions, and all, the, all of you that are out there watching, uh, you know, in uh, Teams land, but uh, it is an honor to be with you, all of you today. Look, I, I've kind of said, I mean, the, this is a critical moment. Uh, there is, you know, there's language even in the international uh, defense or national security strategy that President Biden put out a month or so ago that really talks about, you know, we're in a competitive race on a technological front. It's a technological race. And uh, and, and I do see this as a race that has to be, well, it will be decided sometime in the next 10 years. And I think uh, whoever wins that race uh, has a far better chance of controlling uh, the chess pieces for the rest of at least through mid-century, maybe maybe the entire century, but certainly through mid-century. This has to be something that all of us uh, really endeavor to be a part of on the positive side. Uh, and and all of you, you know, bright minds out there, uh, you're you're a different generation than myself. And and again, I do think that over time, you, well, I try to expand my horizon by reading a lot. Younger folks, just by just by nature of where you are in your life, have a broader view, and sometimes ideas that uh, that I have not come up with and never will come up with. So I 
value and love to have input from from members of the team that have ideas. And so what I'm telling you is don't be shy. Don't be shy. You know, like Mike did. I mean, if you got an idea, throw it on the table because that idea may be the winner. It just may be the one that wins the day. And uh, you, you'd hate to, you know, go for 34 years and realize that, you know, I kind of thought about that and I didn't say something. And now China's got it. We don't. Don't let that happen. If you got an idea, be bold. And yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you're wrong once in a while. Oh, maybe. But you know what? If you're right, you, you could be uh, you could be one of those disruptors I showed the slide of a future disruptor. So with that, I, again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being with you, and I uh, wish you all a great day. Uh, uh, thanks, Admiral. And we're we're going to sign out here, sir. So thank you very much. You're welcome.